Good morning, everybody. Good morning, y'all. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning and welcome. Uh, if you open up the uh, the chat function there, just go up to the little bow up on the top right. Go ahead and click that and make sure you go to the link that's going to be posted here. I will post it right now. My name is Phil, by the way. I'll be your facilitator today, and I have Dylan with me. He's uh, your moderator. He's actually going to be, um, you know, monitoring the uh, chat function here and uh, making sure if, if there's any questions, uh, he'll he'll call them out for me in case I miss it. But please go ahead and go to uh, that link there. Uh, you'll probably hear me say this a few times here, but uh, once you go to the link, uh, it's going to open to a page. You're going to put your name in, any name in, really doesn't matter. Um, and then uh, you're going to pick a persona that you like to be today. Uh, make sure you only pick one. Uh, it'll say launch persona with a blue button. Uh, once you launch that persona, um, it's basically going to pop up into a new window with a virtual desktop and it's going to be black. OK, you'll see a few icons there, um, a black background. OK, so we'll get everybody in here real quick. Phil and Dylan, do we have any limits on the lab in terms of uh, numbers? Didn't we have 20 personas total or? We do, yes, we have 20 personas. Um, if if um, we run out, uh, we'll just have to have them watch and then maybe take some notes. Um, yeah. But then. Uh, we have a large audience, I guess, expected today. So thanks, everyone, okay. for your interest in M365 uh, security. Certainly, we'll uh, do as much as we can to, you know, make it as lively as possible. It being in a um, facilitated, uh, you know, uh, lab experience like it is, it's, um, you know, there are some limits and so forth. So if there's two people from one organization and just one of you wants to grab the lab, that's possible too. Whatever, we're uh, we're flying and hoping to get as much information out there as possible. So. Welcome, Rob. Welcome, George. Go ahead and go into the chat window and I already posted a message with you for you guys with a link. Go ahead and press on that. If you guys have any questions or anyone in the, anyone in the chat or in the room need help, I'm more than welcome to help you guys out. Yeah, and while you do that, uh, I'll share my screen for you. Let me see. Share my screen here. So it's going to look something like this. Uh, once this pops up, you're going to put your name in like I did. Uh, and then you're going to pick a persona that you like to be today. Usually they have a picture, but you know, for some reason it hasn't been coming up the last uh, week here. But uh, usually they have a picture of you know the persona, right? Uh, we'll all but, be blanks. We'll all be blanks yeah. today. <laughs> exactly. Uh, launch the persona here, uh, the blue button. If it's used, uh, it'll look like this. Only take one, please. Uh, once it launches, uh, it's actually going to go into this uh, black background here. You have a few icons on the top left here. Uh, and then um, once you're there, uh, give me a GTG in the window, just like this. And that lets me know that you're good to go. All right. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. All right. Already getting in there. That's what I'm talking about. And there's a, you know, there's a few ways of learning, right? Uh, there's a, you know, death by PowerPoint. Um, I'm sure everybody which is likes. usually what I do. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, I do whiteboards and other things too, but. <laughs> <laughs> but it's uh, it's definitely you might see a few slides here, uh, but other than that, uh, you know, it's all about the customer experience, right? Where you're actually going in and clicking with me, right? Um, and then while you're clicking with me um, and maneuvering through uh, M365 here, um, you know, Take some notes if you like, but also too, if you don't want to, uh, you know, go around and click with me, you just want to watch, that's totally fine too. Um, let me get uh, Martin in here real quick. And we'll probably be starting in about a minute or two. Uh, we just want to make sure everybody's in here before we start. And then we'll, we'll a lot of good it. to go. So people are in labs. So this is in a lab environment. You're not going to break anything. OK, so, you know, if uh, <laughs> during downtime you want to poke around a little bit, feel free. Um, don't run any scripts. <laughs> That's all we ask. <laughs> <laughs> that impacts others. Um, um, it's for Martin, the person way in the lobby. It's just getting, giving them a second. I'm not sure if uh, it's on their yeah. end or our end. Yeah, I saw that too. I uh, tried to admit him and then uh, it just kind of spins and then he's just still sitting in there. 
maybe another minute or so. Phil, do you have the slides too? Uh, I believe, um, no, do you have the slides? Uh, where do you get? I can share my screen if I need to. Okay. I have I have our slides. Is that okay. yeah? I mean everyone oh. on here. Yeah, in general, it, if there's, I think everyone on here is pretty uh, knowledgeable with regards to Peters and Associates. Uh, I will uh, I will certainly put some slides up there just to kind of orient you. Um, All right. For those that don't know, we've so we've passed our 40 year mark uh, in terms of uh, being in business. So we've kind of morphed and transformed as um, through the years as we've moved from uh, what a mainframe world pretty much into a PC world. Uh, we opened our days that we opened our doors the day the PC came out and was announced. Um, you know, gone through the virtualization phase. We've gone through the cloud phase. We've gone through the uh, you know. Um, transitions I guess uh, that all we've all enjoyed I think uh, and um, I would say today uh, what we've kind of decided is that uh, it's great to leverage uh, the expertise of others and we've got uh, with us as a training partner one of the national training partners uh, from Microsoft uh, you know that is one of Microsoft's preferred training partners to kind of help deliver what's called a customer immersion experience which is in a lab environment as you're in today um, to kind of make it real, right? And kind of bring the training and the education one step further. Again, it's uh, we're not really trying to sell things as much as we're trying to educate you and make sure that you're aware of what uh, options are out there, especially with M365, which has a whole dizzying array of things. Um, you know, I think all the services that we offer. Um, and today we're obviously talking uh, predominantly about security as the way it's presented through the Microsoft 365 stack, which many of you may own or might be uh, looking to own as you transition to Microsoft's new licensing model called New Commerce Edition uh, that we're in discussions with you about. Um, obviously, portion of this is also cloud too. So um, we'll discuss our offerings and some of the things that will come out of here uh, that are available um, and have been available. Uh, nothing different here one day MFA and security review, and we'll kind of cover some of those in a little bit. One thing I would love to point you to, um, and I'll share this link uh, momentarily in the chat window. It's a site I've been using uh, quite a bit recently, and it's you know written by uh, someone who's got a blog. This is effectively a mapping exercise uh, for all that you may own within uh, Office 365. So there are several things you can click in here just to kind of look at things. So if you wanted to just look at Enterprise Mobility Suite and what's in there, you know, here are all the buttons, if you will, that are available. And so we could have a discussion about EMS and what you own and, you know, discuss conditional access as an example, things of that nature. But what's been really helpful is under the feature matrix, um, when you can uh, take a couple products, and I'm going to select none at this point, and let's just say you're uh, evaluating today something like uh, you're on Office 365 E3, and we're having a discussion with you about business premium. You can now look at a feature by feature basis and kind of look what would you, what, where are you at today, and where could you be, and things of that nature. So we've been using this uh, chart quite a bit. Um, I'll share this link. You guys are welcome to poke around, but it kind of, these are some of the elements that we wanted to bring to life, right? We want to look at some things that you might own and look at, um, I don't know, uh, might it be multi-factor authentication or um, e-discovery or um, uh, secure score, things of that nature, which we're going to be taking a look at today. So with that, Phil, why don't you take us back to the lab and let's get started. All right. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. And uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, Microsoft uh, M365 uh, security training here. Um, you know, my name is Phil, by the way. Um, I'll be your facilitator. But uh, if, you, if you haven't done so already, make sure you go to the chat. Um, go ahead and click that link. Get a persona if there's any left. I know we got a big class here, uh, but um, if there aren't any, uh, we can always invite you back to get you uh, in there. But, um, you know, go ahead and take some notes. And yeah, watch. we're running this again next month, too. So, you know, just uh, if you want to have other people in your organization attend uh, or um, want to see it again, you can. We're trying to change the flavor a little bit each time with regards to some of the things we show. So. Yeah. And uh, 
yeah, with the customer agent experience, you would just be clicking with me. Um, what I'd like you to do right now, though, is uh, go to the chat and uh, put in, you know, what brought you here today. Um, you know, there are a sequence of events per se, uh, but if I can get to something uh, that you're looking at or that you're uh, wanting to learn, I can try to get to you, okay? Um, and while you do that, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I was a first sergeant in the Marine Corps uh, for 20 years. Uh, I was a commu communications guy by trade, but you know, while in my tenure, I directed both joint multinational forces and special operations. Um, really what I did in the Marine Corps as a communicator is really just established cohesive communications. Rather, it was uh, you know, uh, computers, radios, anything digital that you can talk on, uh, I did. So if you, if you can think everything that you have in your home or, or your office, right? All that infrastructure, uh, everything like that, and take it and then plop it down into the uh, the desert somewhere um, and make it work. Uh, that's that's basically what I did. So <laughs> it's horrible. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but uh, I had uh, four combat tours in uh, Afghanistan and Iraq. I was a combat instructor and an anti-terrorism officer. And I also have a master's degree in Homeland Security. So my entire adult life has been security of some sort. Uh, so I'm glad uh, that I'm here and, uh, you know, talking to you today. So I do need your interaction. So, uh, you know, if you have a question, please ask your question at any time. You're not, you know, interrupting uh, whatsoever. Uh, you can ask it out loud. Uh, you can put it into the chat if you like. Um, and then we can answer those questions as they come in. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and get started here. Um, we're really going to be covering some of the key capabilities and functions of the Microsoft 365 Security Suite, right? And, you know, what you'll notice about Microsoft is how they really change the way they protect a customer's business as they transition from, you know, on-prem to a cloud service, right? Uh, you know, it's no longer about, you know, protecting the perimeter around your resource anymore, um, you know, but it's also about the air above, you know. Uh, so, as a recently retired Marine, I'm, you know, I do understand uh, physical security. Uh, thank you, Jacob. Appreciate it. But also, um, you know, cybersecurity as well, because... Uh, you know, fortunately for me, uh, in the Marine Corps, we use the same terminology. It's kind of weird. Uh, you know, defense in depth, um, you know, multiple layers of security, right? And that's really what, um, you know, a Marine in defense is. So, um, so the way I kind of think about it, it's kind of weird, but if you, if you, if you can think about it like this, um, if you can imagine, you know, a bunch of MiG fighter jets, right? And they're piloted by hackers and they're dropping bombs on your network and, you know, what we really need now is intelligent access controls. And, you know, this really ensures that only approved users can access secure information. And we're really going to get into that. Um, I'm going to share my screen here. And everybody should be here uh, at this black background here with a couple icons on the left. Uh, if you're not, it's all right. But um, go ahead and get there if you can. What I'd like you to do is go to the browser within the browser, okay? Not your browser, browser within the browser, right? Uh, so go ahead and open that up and go to office.com and I'll put it in the chat real quick. Office.com. And for any reason, if you have a problem signing in, uh, a lot of times up here on the browser, um, little icon on the top right, uh, you'll see a little persona uh, picture. Uh, if that's not there, you have to log in there first. Uh, you don't have to put any credentials. You just click the persona, you click continue, uh, and then you can log in to office.com automatically. Uh, everything will be done for you. So once you're there, what I'd like you to do is go to the home button here on the top left. See the home button up on the top left? I want you to go all the way down to the admin center, okay? Uh, it's the A with the little pinwheel. Um, and go ahead and click that there. And really what I'm showing you is how to get from basically office and how to kind of maneuver through um, into M365, right? So you're in your admin center here and I want you to do is go from home on the top left and go all the way down to uh, show all. And once you go to show all, it's gonna pop up everything on this blade here. Uh, and then on the admin centers, right? We have uh, the top three, security, compliance, and endpoint manager. Uh, these are the three topics we're really going to get into today. Um, but I'd like you to go to first is compliance. All right. So go to compliance. Go ahead and click compliance. And it's going to open up to a new window here. And uh, once it pops up and say, welcome to Microsoft 365 Compliance Center. 
And right at the get go, um, we're just going to go from the top right. OK, you can see my persona here, right? My picture. You can see your settings here. Uh, and then as you scroll over to the home uh, little tab here, um, what I'd like you to do is go from home and I want you to go down to solutions. OK, and then under solutions, I want you to go to data loss prevention. All right, so go to data loss prevention. Go ahead and click that. And really, first off, so we have a quick question. Yeah, uh, Jacob's asking what credentials do I sign in with? It's just the CIE or the persona ones, right? Yeah, uh, if you didn't get a persona, Jacob, uh, you just have to watch uh, if there's no more personas left once you, once you click that link, right? But if if for some reason um, you you are in the persona, right, and you're on the virtual desktop, and you clicked into office.com and it won't let you in, it's just the uh, the top right. Um, on the browser itself, you click that little, you know, picture icon, right? You click it and then you just put in sign in. You click the persona that you are, whoever you are today, whether it's like Ligu or, you know, um, Deborah Berger or whatever it is, uh, and then just hit continue. And then once you go to office.com, it'll actually just log in for you automatically. So the credentials are cached is what it comes down to. So. Yeah. <laughs> And if the cache credentials aren't working, they're probably going to be too long to, to convey in this thing. So we'll click along. And, yeah, and uh, if if you are still having problems, uh, just let uh, Dylan know. Dylan know, yeah. I hope, yeah. But uh, yeah, with uh, Microsoft, um, you know, really has a solid data loss prevention. Yeah, no problem, Jacob. Uh, solution, right? And uh, really, it provides a simple method on protecting sensitive information, whether it's risky or inappropriate sharing or transfer and even use sometimes, right? So as you look here at uh, data loss prevention on this overview page, uh, you can see you can read uh, official documents, right? Uh, you can see the latest and greatest news. And then also too, um, you can watch the DLP videos, which you know Microsoft posts on YouTube. So it takes you a link to YouTube. You can watch those videos and get some more information there. Uh, but if you go up to overview here and go up to policies, and if you click policies, we're actually going to make a policy today. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is go down to create policy and click that with a little plus sign there. All right. And then right at the get go, uh, you know, basically start with a template, right? Or create a custom policy. Uh, what's great about templates is you don't have to invent the wheel, right? Uh, it kind of helps you out uh, and Microsoft loves giving templates out. So uh, you can search for templates here. Uh, if you go to all uh, countries and regions, right? You can see, um, you know, different countries are out there. Uh, so if you were just looking uh, within the United States, you click United States, only the United States would pop up. But if you were from Australia per se, uh, it would do the same thing. Uh, if you go up over to categories here, we got financial, medical and health, privacy, custom and then uh, enhance, which is a new uh, little tab there. Uh, but if what, what I'd like you to do is go ahead and click financial, right? And you can see all the templates that pop up, right? Um, and same thing with uh, medical and health. You see privacy here. You can custom, right? Or, or the enhanced one, okay? Which is uh, other, other ones. But what I'd like you to do is, I want you to go to uh, financial real quick. Uh, click financial. And then what I'd like you to do is go down to uh, U.S. Federal Trade Commission. Now, what if I didn't know what that meant, right? Or any of these templates, if I didn't really know what, I, what those mean, what I can do is I can click on it, right? It gives a brief description of what this is and then what kind of information we are trying to protect using this template, right? So using this template, we can uh, protect information like credit card numbers, account numbers, and routing numbers, which is really great. So. Uh, we're going to do this one today. Uh, what I want you to do is go down to uh, next on the blue button at the bottom. So go ahead and go to next. <clears throat> now this is the only one that actually uh, populates a, a name and a description, right? Usually what you have to do is put it in yourself. Uh, but what I'd like you to do is at the very end of right after rules, right? Just put your name, all right? Don't put my name, put your name. Um, and then description. Uh, you can change the description if you like or leave it as is. Uh, just so you know, FYI, um, right here where the little red asterisk are the ones that you have to fill out. 
Uh, if it doesn't like this description one here, you don't have to, okay? So go ahead and hit next here. And now we're gonna choose a location to apply this policy, right? So obviously we have all these buttons on, uh, they, they come on automatically, right? Uh, but you can turn them on or off depending on, you know, what you would want. Um, but as you look at this, you know, the locations that we can choose from are, are multi, right? So, you know, uh, Exchange Mail, right? Uh, SharePoint, OneDrive, um, Team Chat, and Channel um, Messages, which is really great because when we think about, you know, actually, um, you know, sending information back and forth, a lot of people think email, right? Right off the bat. Uh, but because Teams is getting more integrative and, you know, it's the new way to communicate, right? Just like we are on, uh, you know, today, um, you know, really when we're talking about Teams Chat and your sending you know messages back and forth and hey here's that here's that number you need here's that information uh here you go it's quick um but you know when we're talking about personal information a lot of times um it could be you know sent to somebody they're not supposed to be sending to or you know we're, we're really what we're doing here is preventing people from making mistakes right um but you know as you go down, uh, go ahead and hit next here. So we're gonna keep all those on by the way. Uh, and then really just define the policy, okay? Uh, define the policy, uh, really we're just, it's just showing uh, what we're actually protecting, right? Credit card, account, and routing numbers. So go ahead and hit next here. We're not gonna change anything there. Uh, but right here where it says edit, right? Go ahead and click edit on the blue button here. Uh, this blade will pop up, right? Um, and basically what you can do is you can change the confidence levels, low, medium, high, right? And you can, you know, tweak and change things here. Um, and really what that is, is let's say, uh, for instance, uh, credit card number, you know, the total number of digits, what, 16, right? Uh, so if you, uh, maybe you have order numbers in your company or something that's 16 digits as well, uh, to keep it getting from mixed up, um, you know, basically we just change the confidence levels uh, to ensure that, you know, it, it recognizes, you know, which one's which, okay? Uh, but we're just gonna hit save here. We're not gonna change anything there. And then uh, go ahead and hit next. And then protection action. So they're already clicked for you, right? But let's talk about this first one real quick. Um, when content matches the, the policy uh, conditions, just like I just showed you just right now, uh, low, medium, or high, right? We wanna make sure it matches. Uh, and then also too, we wanna show policy tips uh, when users are sending an email, right? So um, I don't know if you've ever seen it before. Uh, you might have, uh, depending on your security. Uh, but when you go into your Outlook, right? Let's say I put in a social security number or a card number or something that I'm not supposed to be sending, right? And it'll say a hey, policy tip right on the top left there. And it's basically like a red flag, right? So the red flag is basically giving you a warning saying, hey, you know, this is some no-go criteria. I don't know if you want to send this stuff, right? Um, you know, and then basically uh, you can still send it, you know, because it's just giving you a, a basically a red flag saying, hey, be, be aware, right? Uh, but also too, we can get even more strict where if something, you, you know, you put something like that in there, uh, like a credit card number, it, it will prevent you from even sending the actual email. So uh, just really depending on, um, you know, your guys' security and what you want is really, you know, depending, right? Yep, the and friendly information message versus the enforcement. Uh, you've got both capabilities here. Data loss prevention, just think of it as like a big flashlight going across all of your data, whether it's data in motion with email uh, or when it's data just in storage, like in OneDrive. Um, most, all of you, I guess, on the call, um, I'm going to assume all of you own the technology that you're seeing right here. So if you're not taking advantage of data loss prevention, it certainly is an area that um, is wise to take advantage of for data, um, both uh, inadvertent and malicious uh, being sent out of your organization. You know, how many times have you sent to, you know, um, I'll say Bruce Ward uh, instead of Bruce Wayne, you know, who worked at your company, you know, that sort of thing. So people accidentally type and if that happened to be a spreadsheet right with a bunch of customer information and it went out then you know would you have to do a disclosure statement and so forth so again it's not always malicious uh, sometimes it's accidental and you're you're with the goal of protecting the one piece that uh, you know i would say that most people 
may not own uh, unless you have the E5 series is the real time uh, data loss prevention uh, and basically chat um, monitoring within teams. So within teams, as we're having a chat right now, if someone was to type something um, that would be against policy, then we uh, those that own E5 could have a DLP policy that would look at that data as soon as people are literally typing it uh, and post it, it would scrutinize it and say, whoa, that's against policy and pull it. Uh, if that was, a, again, that's an E5 uh, level feature and capability, but part of data loss prevention. So, Phil, this is great. Uh, the amount of counts obviously is very uh, important as you're kind of noting here. And, um, and, you know, certainly people can craft a DLP policy that would match, you know, their organizational needs. We usually see organizations um, really working hard on what they consider confidential information. So maybe starting with a template uh, as you're doing here. And then, you know, there's certainly some proprietary data usually organizations have, whether it be account number formats uh, or certain forms. Uh, this has some something called document fingerprinting in it too, where it will like actually look at, uh, I don't know, like an I-9 form as an example. You can load that up and it will just look for any I-9 form Assuming, you know, even if you load a blank one, it will say, OK, I've seen that form before and I know that often it has, you know, Social Security and driver's license and people's health information uh, and uh, address information. So I'm going to count that as confidential. Things like that can all be rolled into a data loss prevention uh, strategy here. So. Exactly, exactly. And, and by the way, um, you probably get that a lot, huh, Bruce Wayne? Uh, I get Clark Kent all the time. Uh, you so know. Can't Bruce play. Wayne, Burt Ward, I'm the combination, uh, Batman and Robin. So. <laughs> nice, nice. So yeah, uh, we're going to move on here. Uh, we're going to go to uh, next down to the bottom here. I go ahead and click next. Uh, and really you're just uh, customizing access here. Uh, so audit or restrict uh, activities, right, on a device. So depending, if you click that box right here, depending on what you would want, right? Uh, but let, let's say for instance, we deal with uh, credit card numbers all the time, our company here, right? Our make-believe company. Uh, and, you know, maybe we don't want people to copy and paste, uh, you know, credit card numbers on a clipboard on their, you know, personal computer or, you know, on their desktop, right? Or whatever, right? Uh, you know, we can, we can prevent that. We can prevent, you know, people um, putting in, you know, uh, USB removable drives where they can put information in there or even printing things out, which is kind of cool. Um, you know, I got, you know, the uh, the question, well, what if they take a picture with their phone? Well, that's that's what it is. And just people have to be doing the right things, right? Uh, but, um, you know, on here, at least, we can prevent people from making mistakes. So, um, but restrict their uh, party applications, um, you know, depending on, you know, what you're using, uh, you know, third party is not, you know, Microsoft, right? So things like uh, Cisco, um, Dropbox, right? Salesforce, which is which is pretty cool. Um, but uh, go ahead and go to next here at the bottom. And really, this is the most important part about the policy um, because really it's kind of like buying a new car, right? When you buy a new car, what do you do? You test drive it, right? Uh, so what we're gonna do here is test drive this policy ensure that it's not you know so strict that we're you know basically in a straitjacket right um but not so loose that we can still do whatever we want uh so we definitely want to test it out and then through the testing period basically what you're doing is you're tweaking and you're you know calibrating and you're you know basically getting on target right um and once you are good then that's where you would come back here you would turn it on right away uh, if there was a policy that you are using currently and you wanted to, you know, keep it off, you can keep it off here as well. So go ahead and hit next here at the bottom blue button. And then right here we can review any kind of edits that we need to do. You can, um, you know, it's just a quick look, um, edit whenever you want, uh, and then hit submit. So go ahead and hit submit real quick. And take a quick second. And basically once... Um, once this is submitted through, it's going to say you create a new policy and then you can hit done at the bottom here. All right, so hit done. And you can see uh, United States Federal Trade Commission. Um, basically, mine is right here, right? Uh, so 
if I wanted to, um, you know, basically I can see all my policies right here, right? So let me see. I'm going to refresh here and see if anybody's joined me. All right. Maybe you guys are right behind me. That's okay. Uh, but what I'd like you uh, to watch is basically what I just showed you, right? On making, um, you know, this uh, DLP policy. Um, you can either do this with me or you can just watch. Uh, but I'm going to go to office.com real right quick. And I'm going to go to my teams here. And I'm going to open my teams because I'm basically just going to show you uh, what we just did. As teams pulls up here. Yeah, you know, it's good to put policies in non-enforcement mode. I mean, this might be, uh, you know, you're just looking for people who are, uh, again, trying to prevent accidental uh, or looking for purposeful disclosure of data. Um, and, you know, putting it in test mode will allow you to see, you know, how many frequency, what's the frequency of uh, number of hits, essentially, that you're getting per month. Make sure that it's uh, in a good place at the end of the month, and then uh, and then you can activate it. Oftentimes, uh, we use these rules even for things like uh, encrypting emails outbound, right? Uh, people do need to send in, uh, mail. Sometimes they don't know that they have the ability to send it encrypted. Um, you know, if you're sending more than three instances of uh, customer information or what we deem customer confidential, encrypt it, right? Uh, everybody here owns encrypted email outbound, so should be scrutinizing. Uh, you might train your employees to how to send a encrypted email, uh, and when they remember, they'll do so. But when they forget, uh, data loss prevention is there to help make sure that uh, your data is not going out uh, in just a general email screen. That's right. And right here, basically, uh, I'm just messaging uh, my coworker, right? Uh, Deborah here, right? Maybe we work together uh, and I'm like, hey, here's that Visa card number that you need. Uh, you know, maybe it's Bruce's card number, right? That's not really Bruce's card number. I was gonna say, let's go buy, let's go shopping. <laughs> and then uh, as I send it, basically uh, what's gonna happen, it's gonna recognize, uh, you know, how many digits, right? Um, and it's gonna be blocked, right? So, and it tells you right here, this message was blocked. Now, this is me sending stuff that, you know, I'm not supposed to be sending, right? But what if you're the person that has to send stuff like this back and forth? You're the uh, the HR person or, or the, uh, you know, the, I don't know, the accountant, uh, you know, department or whatever, right? Um, you know, we can, beforehand, we would make sure that you had the right permissions to send stuff back and forth, right? Uh, but what if I still needed to send this to Deborah because it's hugely important, as, you know, and it says, you know, what can I do? And basically, if you click that, it kind of opens up a, a little window there. But you can basically in the background, you put your, um, you know, phone number or, you know, a link to your help desk. So they get with the help desk, uh, you know, a conditional access for that, you know, period of time or whatever it is uh, to send that information out. OK, uh, but I am going to be sending out some polls here, uh, just kind of seeing where you guys are at. Um, some information here and I'm going to be sending the very first one. Oh. That feature that he just showed, by the way, in this is in a Teams chat. So uh, that was exactly the feature I mentioned. That is an additional licensing level. Uh, so many of you might not own that capability to do DLP right there in the chat, but um, many of you might either own it. Uh, you know, some of you might own it soon, I guess is what it comes down to. So. Sure, sure. So if, uh, have you ever implemented uh, DLP in your organization? Uh, just seeing if you've ever done anything like this before. If you can answer no. that for me. Um, could you check uh, one of the personas permissions, Joni Sherman? Sure. You mean a restart Permissions to what? Is that to uh, the admin center? Uh, yeah. The uh, one second here. We'll take care of you, Jacob. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Who is it, Jenny? Yeah, Jenny. Sorry, everyone. Give me one second here. I'm going to start this over for Jacob here, and then we'll we'll move on to the next uh, little lab we got going. Go ahead and <clears throat> fill out that poll, though, if you haven't already. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. It's moving slow today. All right, Jenny. Where's Jenny? Let's get the next one. 
Did I pass it? Sorry. Yeah, I think it's on the top right there. Oh, yeah, right there. There. there we go. First row. All right. Uh, if you were following b beforehand, please go back to um, the Compliance Center real quick while I restart this. All right. <clears throat> Jacob, go ahead and try it now. And if that doesn't work, I, it seems that there's another persona open. But Joni, we just reset it, Joni. All right. Okay. So if you're, back to, yeah, <laughs> I knew it. if you're back at the Compliance Center, uh, go ahead and get back there real quick. Um, <clears throat> so now what we're going to actually talk about is, um, you know, basically uh, security labels, right? Or sensitivity labels, uh, depending on, you know, what you like to call them, right? Uh, but <clears throat> what I'd like you to do is go from uh, data loss prevention uh, under solutions there, and you're going to go to information protection, okay? It's about third one uh, down from uh, DOP. And go ahead and click that. <clears throat> And it's going to pull up uh, information protection overview, right? Um, with, you know, when we're talking about security labels, right, or sensitivity labels, um, you know, when, when people are talking about security, we're, we're trying to protect information, right? Um, but when we're talking about, um, you know, single documents, right, um, you know, files should be self-protecting. Files should know who has the rights to open them and what rights they have, you know, because the best security is self-protection, right? Um, and unfortunately, about 58% of people really admit to uh, sending sensitive information they're not supposed to to the wrong person. Uh, so when we're talking about that, we're basically what we're doing is we're encrypting single documents, right? And we're actually putting a label across uh, the actual document to let people know, you know, there's sensitive information on the document if they can see it. Uh, but with the encryption part, really what we're doing is we're encrypting it and then only letting certain people see that type of document depending on, you know, the permissions they have, right? Uh, so it's basically, you know, if they have the key to unlock the door to see the permission, uh, then they can see it. And if they don't, even if I do send it to them, uh, they still can't open it, which is cool. Uh, but uh, this overview here. <clears throat> Um, you know, basically what you can do, same thing as uh, before, you can read documents, you can see the latest and greatest news, and you can watch the most recent videos on uh, sensitivity labels here. So what I'd like you to do is go up to uh, overview up on the top, and then the very first one, labels. Uh, go to labels real quick. We're actually going to make a label, right? I'm going to show you how to make a label. Uh, and then after we make the label, I'm going to show you how to make it a policy. Okay, so it's kind of a, a twofer here. So uh, right here, very first one, uh, I want you to go down to the little plus sign where it says create label. Go ahead and go there, uh, hover, hover over real quick and go ahead and click that. And right here, basically it, it's saying, hey, create a new uh, tool tip, right, uh, for your label. So uh, on under name, I want you to put your name, okay? So actually Phil, for this one, maybe maybe we'll just have you go through it because I know MFA is the next one and I think that one people like to interact with. So why don't we just have you for speed reasons, go through this one. We'll keep this one at five minutes. In, in implementation, this is the greatest, this is awesome, right? This is the best thing ever. That said, we only have about 5% of our customers, I would say, that are working in this space. Um, I think um, people have, a, they they uh, they tend to add, bring a lot of complexity to this. They try to think, I need to have a document policy, uh, like a retention policy for everything. Where we're seeing this implemented and implemented effectively are for organizations that have GDPR needs, okay? So you need to tag your data that would be sensitive to GDPR rules or potentially for uh, organizations who have CMMC needs. Uh, um, you specifically have some uh, supplier uh, to the De uh, Department of Defense needs, and you have some specific data to that. So start small, I guess, is a, would be my recommendation. Find the data that you really want to label. Um, Phil's going to show you a capability to label data manually. Um, you can imagine uh, in small sets of data, that's possible. Um, with large sets of data, Microsoft does have a scanner that would run through your data on, let's say, a G drive or OneDrive or SharePoint uh, or any NTFS volume and basically find certain criteria. Maybe it mentions 
a user's name or health record, and it could auto tag. That is a whole exercise, right, by itself, and it also is a new licensing skew. So we won't show that today, but know that that's it's capable of growing to that. Uh, we actually partner with an organization that that works specifically with data because Peters and Associates, in general, we're about more about the systems than about the data. But this is great information to know because that DLP rule that you just learned about, he's going to show you that basically tagged data can now be acted upon with this. So Phil, I'll hand it back to you with that context. Yeah, and I was just kind of moving through here. Uh, so, yeah. you know, because of time and everything. Uh, but basically what we're doing is, um, you know, we're going to encrypt and mark the document, just like I was talking about before. Uh, and so you get three options. We're only going to do one. Uh, but, you know, basically I'm going to create a watermark. And why are we creating watermarks for documents? Uh, for people. Um, so let's say, for instance, you have a 100 page document. It has a social security number on there uh, because that's what we're doing. We're protecting social security numbers on, on this one right here. So, um, you know, if for some reason, uh, you know, we have a 100 page document with a measly one uh, social security number in there somewhere, um, from every page, it, it will give that watermark and it'll let you know, hey, uh, somewhere on this document, you know, is a social security number. So that way you can find it, you can either take it off or at least that you know before you send it out, um, you know, to the wrong person or, you know, whatever, right? So uh, you can put anything in there that you like. Um, you know, we can put, do not send PII, right? We can put in uh, secret, top secret, confidential, uh, anything, anything you want. I'm just putting a reminder in there. And then really with font size, you know, basically it starts with 10, but I'm going to make it big and it can change the color here for the font or diagonal or horizontal for the layout. Uh, but I'm going to hit next here. And then right here, uh, basically all I'm doing is I'm going to go ahead and create a sensitivity info type here. Uh, and basically what I'm doing is I'm taking almost like a template here. So on this, on this blade, um, you know, basically what I can do is I can look through a whole bunch of, uh, you know, different countries, right? Uh, everything's alphabetical order. So I'm going down to the United States here uh, and I'm going to pick United States Social Security numbers because that's what I'm protecting here. Um, but there's many things that you can do here, right? If you look at uh, your screen here, you can see there's physical addresses, right? Uh, taxpayer information, um, driver's license numbers, account numbers, right? Uh, passport numbers and what if um, you know our company uh, deals with somebody in the UK right um, we can we can protect their information as well or, or any other country right uh, that we um, work with right uh, but I'm gonna click that one I'm gonna hit add here and basically <clears throat> excuse me uh, it'll say uh, you know display this message do not send PII right Click through here real quick. Um, and then, by the way, we can only do, uh, you know, documents and emails in this, uh, you know, um, demo, right, or uh, or uh, CIE. It doesn't give us the option for groups and sites and then even pushing it over Azure as well. Uh, but, you know, you could do that in your uh, system. I'm going to click next here. So it's basically the same thing. I'm looking for an overview. I'm, I'm creating this label here. Um, and then once I create the label, right, um, it's kind of like um, when you're in high school and you, you create a whole bunch of uh, flyers for the dance, right, that you're going to hand out. Um, you know, but nobody's going to know about the dance until you actually pass them out, right? Uh, so it's kind of the same thing here. I can make as many labels as I want, but until I publish one of those labels, then it becomes a policy uh, that it's in, right? So. Uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to click here and um, you can either uh, the circle and publish label or I can go up here and publish label. It all goes to the same spot. Um, but within here, basically, it's asking me, hey, is this the one that you want to publish? Yes, uh, this is the one I just made, the fill one, right? Uh, and then it's all for users and groups here. So we're good there, right? Um, but what I want you to do is look at look at your screen here. Um, you know, these ones aren't clicked for you automatically, uh, but you should click uh, the very first one because it, it you must provide, right, uh, justification to remove a label 
uh, and lower the classification, okay? Why do we want that? Uh, what if, you know, if somebody, you know, removes the label uh, off of something that has, you know, sensitive information on it, uh, basically what we want is that, you know, um, breadcrumbs, right? Uh, you know, we, we kind of want to follow it back if it gets into the, you know, wrong hands or if it goes to the wrong person, we can kind of see and keep people honest by, you know, going back and looking at that. Uh, and then also to the second one here, uh, we want to um, require users to apply this uh, label to emails and documents. And then I don't know if you guys use Power BI. It's a great tool uh, to use, uh, you know, especially if you're, you know, somebody that's making good decisions uh, throughout the day. Uh, we can even push it over uh, Power BI as well. So if I go to next here, and basically what I'm doing is I'm going to apply my label to everything we just clicked on. So documents, emails, right? And then also to Power BI because I clicked that one. Um, and then basically what I'm doing is now I created the label, right? And I put my name in there, but now we're creating the policy here. So maybe I, you know, I'm going to put Phil, right? But you would probably put like, GDPR yeah. or CMMC yeah. or you know whatever yeah. the whatever the rule might be, and then this is going to this policy is then going to show itself in Word, uh, Outlook, and otherwise for you to apply it. Um, it uh, Phil looks like he does have the licensing to auto apply it also. So um, one of those nice capabilities uh, again in the upper E5 um, licensing skew if you do go yeah. down this route a ton. So. License labeling or, you know, labeling of documents, very important. Uh, oftentimes you'll want to activate um, a bar um, that is not on by default in Word and Excel um, to let people know that this is a quote unquote highly confidential doc or a GDPR doc. Um, it kind of broadcasts itself to them. Um, in addition to the watermark, it's kind of a little label along the top, which is a toolbar you can kind of turn on. but. Outside of that, you know, that GDPR and CMMC use, that's kind of where we're seeing it. Happy to pilot it with you if uh, you have some interest in this space. Um, it's good stuff. And then obviously the hard work of tagging it and identifying your data is now done or at least started in this case. And that's from there you can take on your security policies, right? Your data loss prevention can easily find a document that is tagged. It doesn't need to even rescan. All it does is look for a tag and says, oh, you're already tagged you know, sensitive. So I'm going to apply some policies, whether it be encrypt or deny sending of that data, things of that nature. You can also have, um, uh, you know, sensitivity as to where that data can be stored and things of that nature. So a lot of things can happen once you've kind of done the work. Uh, if we'll always remember the NIST cybersecurity framework, right, and the five pillars that I always talk about, Number one is inventory, and there you go, right? You've done the work of inventorying your data, finding out what's important, and more important, labeling it for future uh, usage. So uh, you're you're beginning the journey of kind of when to apply uh, security policies. So Phil, yeah. I think you're, uh, you're on to the next topic, I think, pretty soon, right? Here? Yeah, uh, I was just gonna show them. Uh, yeah, basically show them the output of that, yep. Real quick. Uh, you know, basically, I, I have a, a document here. <clears throat> I just put in, you know, Phil's social security number, right? Um, that's not my social security number, by the way. But uh, basically, what I'm going to do is I'm I'm going to try to save it, um, you know, to my desktop here. You know, this PC here. I'll put Phil and save. <clears throat> and it's like, whoop, hold up. Can't do that, right? So I go back and you can see my watermark here. So this is where, you know, the watermark, uh, you know, if you were able to open it because you had the, the permissions, right, or the key to open up the door, right, um, you know, you would see this and then you would automatically know, hey, th there's a social security number here somewhere, right? So which is, which is kind of cool. Um, and then two, uh, just so you guys know, uh, you have labels here, right, what, what we just did and then when you have a label policy, once you publish it, right, this is where all the ones that are uh, published are in this one here under policies, label policies. So just so you know. But yeah, definitely that. And then I'm going to be sending another poll here. While you're putting up the poll, I will uh, I'll kind of frame MFA, um, which is, I think, our next topic. Is that correct, Phil? Yeah, yes, sir. So MFA. Um, all of you own MFA right now. Um, if you own Office 365, you own MFA. 
20% of the projects Peters and Associates is doing right now are MFA related. Uh, why is that? Because basically um, authentication is key, right? The, this perimeter, uh, identity perimeter is all you have, okay? Your firewalls uh, are helpful uh, for protecting assets on, on the inside of your network. However, all of your employees are probably working remotely and many of your assets and data uh, is remote too. So the identity perimeter is kind of the one that's been uh, of big importance for the last several years. And the driver for MFA is often cybersecurity insurance and compliance. Uh, both are requiring uh, MFA on in five areas. That uh, the first area, and I guess the first, the area that I guess, the area that uh, security insurance is requiring is on Outlook uh, and access to email. The second one is on um, VPN and remote access. The third is on uh, administrative access internally to your servers. Fourth is on backup. And fifth is on privileged accounts. Those five areas, we're going to be talking about just the first two areas today. Uh, basically, we're going to show you in quick form kind of how to set up admin access, admins for Office 365, and how you would set up um, MFA. If you don't have that set up, we suggest it, uh, do it uh, tomorrow, um, if not today. Um, for your own tenant, um, it is now a default requirement for an Office 365 tenant that is spun up has been for about a year, uh, but most of your tenants have not been spun up in the past year. So uh, if you have an administrator that is making changes in Office 365 without having to be prompted with MFA, um, that would be flagged as uh, negative from a compliance perspective, as well as be against good practice today. Um, Microsoft will state uh, that about half of a percent of all accounts. This is not just admin accounts, but all accounts. So anyone with 200 users in your account, you should expect one of your accounts to be compromised every month. Um, to do that, you would have to be looking for those accounts to be compromised, meaning someone logging in from Nigeria or otherwise. If they have MFA on there, they will not be compromised. There's a 99.9% .9 chance per Microsoft um, that they really can't be because uh, they would have had to, uh, you know, probably do a SIM swap on your phone in addition to knowing your login and password. So it's with that background and context, uh, we'll send you into the MFA world to kind of at least make sure you're aware of where the clicks are, um, to how to know whether it's set up for you and yourself. Um, and uh, thanks for answering the poll uh, on the last section here. Yeah, I appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. <clears throat> I'm gonna get, um, so let me pull it up here. Sorry about that. Uh, but yeah, most definitely, um, you know, managing identities uh, for, you know, basically securing at, excuse me, accessing, there we go, uh, you know, secure information. Uh, so, you know, really what's cool about Microsoft is how you can, you know, leverage managing identities using my, uh, MFA, right? So MFA is critical, right? Because identities are critical, uh, just like, you know, Bruce was saying. Uh, people are, are working from home, uh, so you have to have, you know, that, that type of conditional access, right? Um, but when we're talking about Microsoft or MFA, excuse me, um, you know, it really needs to be the foundation uh, to your security program. Um, a lot of things are moving towards, just like Bruce was saying, your insurance, right? Um, you know, when you're building a home, right, you have to build out a good foundation. Uh, if not, you know, it, it falls over, right? The house falls over. So uh, MFA does need to be that foundation, uh, you know, to your security home, right? And there's many different ways you can use it. You can text by phone, uh, call by phone, uh, use the Authenticator app, which highly recommend if uh, you haven't used. Um, you know, you just go to your uh, your app store, put in Microsoft Authenticator app. I put, you know, download it, basically set it up. It's pretty easy to, d to do. Um, you just hook it up to your your uh, account, right? So basically, once you log in using your username and password, it's actually going to prompt you on your phone here, right? So I got my phone here. It, it's prompting me, "Hey, do you want you want to um, basically approve this login?" Now, obviously, if I'm at my desk, I'm going to say yes, right? Um, a lot of times, 
uh, people are not paying attention and just approving things when they're not around their computer. Um, and that's what you don't want to do because you don't want to let people in using your credentials, right? <clears throat> because when we're talking about lost and stolen credentials, about 80% of that is related to security related breaches, right? And, you know, really organizations these days are worried about that more complex security, more complex security attack. Wow, I can't talk today. Um, and, you know, like the ones you hear in, in the news, right? Oil pipeline, uh, not too long ago, right? That was, that was due to, you know, firmware. Uh, but, you know, when we're talking about big things that affect a lot of people, you know, what we don't hear about in the news is that, you know, a small business owner, right? The mom and pop shop down the street. Um, you don't, you don't hear about that a lot, but it does happen very, very often. And, you know, really, you know, while that happens, you, you just have to have this uh, in place, right? So um, I'm actually going to pull this up here. Remember, you're not sharing screen right now either. Yeah, I'm pulling it up right there. Thank you. Though. Yeah. Got it, got it. So this is under uh, Azure Active Directory, right? And really, I'm just kind of pointing you in the right direction uh, because if I if I turn it on, uh, because it doesn't have uh, MFA on here, uh, it'll lock everybody out. So that would be great. <laughs> Quick way to lock so, people out. So if you go to your admin center, right? If you go to Azure Active Directory, uh, it basically pulls this up. And I'm basically just going to show you where it's at, right? So if you go to uh, Azure Active Directory here, and you go down to uh, Security, and then this is where you can do conditional access. Uh, you can do your MFA here, right? Um, you know, you, these are the things that you can, you know, click and and push and you know create those types of policies here. Now, just like I said, if because I tried it uh, and then I had to restart this whole uh, um, training event uh, one time. So, <laughs> but anyway, um, basically this is where your MFA is uh, conditional access, right? When we're talking about working from home, uh, a lot of people work from home. Uh, I'm at home today, right? Uh, but I would probably say 50% of us or more uh, work from home because it's become, you know, crucial to, to businesses these days because of everything that's going on, right? Uh, so you have to give conditional access to, you know, let people in from, you know, other places, uh, depending on where they're at. Maybe they're, they're on the move, um, you know, traveling, uh, stuff like that. So, um, but... These are, the, you know, the places where you can go uh, and, and look, right? And you can see as I click conditional access, you know, I can, you know, create new policies here, uh, manage online uh, requirement compliance devices. Uh, and then if I, if I were to go back here, let me see you back. And this is all under security, okay? Uh, so uh, you can see MFA here and basically click through here as well. Uh, but... These are the, the things that we can do. Um, just like Bruce was mentioning, you know, with MFA, uh, it's, it's become a staple. Like there is probably not a very many people that don't have MFA. So I'm sure you've seen it before. Um, it's definitely definitely something that you have to have, right? Yeah, and MFA because, is binary, right? It's, uh, it's either on or off, uh, enabled. Uh, I think the two things are enabled, disabled. Uh, there is uh, a, a setting called enforced. Enforced means it's turned on, but that person hasn't logged in yet. So you really probably won't see enforced very often, uh, but really that's what enforced means. So it's either enabled or it's not. Um, what conditional access brings to the table is that, just like it mentions, conditions, right? Certain conditions when you want to enforce it or not enforce it. Um, examples might be, uh, and there are four criteria kind of going in. One could be your location. So you would have to put in all your subnets for your office locations, assuming your uh, employees were at offices, or if they're coming in via VPN, you could also add your VPN into that uh, enforceable location. So locations, one choice, what group they're a member of. So you may um, have some certain groups that are excluded or maybe certain groups that are included in terms of who you want to um, have MFA on applications so what applications they can be uh you can have you know 10 applications that are definitely you want mfa for and 10 applications you don't really care about mfa because they're less important uh less strategic applications and then um 
device. So the device health can be part of that condition too. Uh, if you have a rooted, uh, if you have a rooted iPad, right, um, or um, I don't know, a device that's on a rooted network, do you want to? You know, do you want to evaluate that as part of the criteria and the conditions for going through and MFAing or not? So those are the conditions, and then the actions are, you know, yes, we want to enable MFA. We also could go through like a password change, forced password change. You could block. You could uh, not not have to do MFA. Those are some of the conditions. The one thing that gets a little more interesting, and again, this is with people with E5 licensing, there is something. Uh, called a risk score that can be in incorporated in the conditions. The risk score is your ability to evaluate whether they, um, at this time, does Microsoft think that the risk of that identity is high, medium, or low? And I think they were intending to move this to a graded scale from zero to 100, but I'm not sure if they've done that yet. But if, you're, if you have a high risk uh, identity, what does that mean? Well, it means it either was found in some black blacklist forums, um, or it has recently gone through a number of password changes, or um, has some very strange, uh, you know, what they call impossible travel, meaning you were just logging on on this geography in Iran, and now you're in, in over here in the US. We think that that's impossible. We're going to flag your score as high risk, and therefore it could work your way into your conditional access statements by incorporation of that risk score. Uh, so the risk score is helpful for there, and then it's also helpful because you're given a portal that shows all your high risk users and you may want to, you know, have some ongoing dialogue with them or evaluate, hey, why is my CEO have a high risk um, uh, score on their identity at this point? So some good stuff happening in the MFA world. I will put the cautionary tale out there that Microsoft's MFA, which you own, um, only some of you own the conditional access that I just mentioned. And Microsoft's uh, MFA product does not uh, behave well when against on-prem identities. So if you're logging on to RDP onto your localized server, how do you get prompted for MFA? Well, with Microsoft, you don't. With third parties, you do. So happy to have that conversation with you uh, when that time is needed or if you have that, uh, if that need arises. Yeah. Phil, what's next? Yeah, I'm just going to send out this poll here with, uh, okay. you know, just making sure and seeing if uh, everybody is, uh, you know, has MFA enabled uh, in their organization today. Um, if not, at least now you know, right? Um, you know, the other thing, too, about um, this portion that we should probably mention, too, is, you know, Azure Password Protect, right? Um, you know, Azure Password Protect is definitely great to have, too, because when we're talking about creating passwords, uh, you know, creating the, uh, you know, the the old, uh, what, what's that movie, Spaceballs, right? Where he's like, you know, what's what's the the code? One, two, three, four, five. And he's like, oh, it's the same as my luggage, right? Uh, it's it's the same thing, right? Uh, it's, it's basically saying, hey, this password is way too easy. It's way too, you know, uh, easy to, to either, you know, put in there to, you know, get your password. Uh, so you need to make a new one, right? So I'm, I'm all, I'm, probably more than certain that people have seen this before um, when we're talking about, um, you know, basically uh, passwords that they put in. It's like, hey, it's not strong enough, um, you know, keep going, right? Uh, it's the same type of deal, okay? So we just want to make sure that you're aware of that um, and that that's something out there that you can, you can use uh, for people that are making very good passwords, okay? And the so, good news is it's kind of behind the scenes. So like... Uh, you can enact that policy and only at the Nest password change when a user is going to create it would they uh, stumble when they try to, uh, I don't know, increase their last password by one letter as an example. Um, or even if they create the password pass at word one, which is a legitimate password, eight characters, has complexity, and is the number five guest password on the internet. Okay, pass at word one, which all of your users could probably create today. Something that prevents that, um, and in fact has a dictionary of, I think, a couple hundred thousand uh, easily guessable passwords is Azure password protection that Phil mentions. Um, any of you that have Azure Active Directory Plan 1 have that. It takes about four hours of consulting time, or you do it on your own to get it implemented. It's not hard. 
um, but it keeps you from guessing um, Justin Fields on the Bears uh, or Bears win, which actually is not even a password. It's Bears lose. <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can keep your company name out of your password. So Microsoft keeps a list of uh, easily guessable passwords, and you can have your own policies of easily <laughs> guessed themes that you don't want. And that combines with your complexity requirements to uh, shape your users' policies or passwords uh, moving forward. So thanks, Phil, for the mention on that. Yeah, no problem. No problem. Do you have uh, Do you have the ability to go into Intune, or I, I didn't know if we had uh, if you had set up for that. I, I might skip around. I think just based in the interest of time, we certainly have yeah. seen a lot of customer interest in Intune. Um, people often own it. Uh, Intune uh, people. In fact, it's gotten to the point now where a lot of organizations are asking us to remove SCCM if they have Intune, only for the uh, not not because SCCM. Um, uh, I'm not disparaging SCCM by all means. It's a the, it's a very comprehensive product, and but I think that they don't have the skill set to manage it internally and are looking for something light um, to do in tune management of Windows 10 devices and mobile devices. And maybe if you could poke us uh, around there and maybe um, what you're seeing in the Intune space, that would be helpful. Yeah, sure can. So what I'd like everybody to do is go back to their admin center, right? And if you go under to uh, admin center right here and go to endpoint manager, uh, go ahead and open that up. It's the fancy new name, by the way. So Intune and SCCM combined into endpoint manager, S-C-E-M, because we all needed a new acronym in our lives. Right. <laughs> we, we love acronyms, right? Uh, but <laughs> right. Right off the get-go, uh, right here. So uh, basically up on the top right, you can see your persona here. You, you basically got some icons here. You got your settings. This is, you know, the Azure, right? And so uh, that the Azure look to it, um, you know, because that's what it is. Uh, but as you go over to home, uh, you can see the dashboard here. So if you were, you know, monitoring this, uh, you know, you can definitely go here, go to edit. You can kind of, you know, if I want to clock here, right? And you can kind of move these things around. Uh, you know, depending on what you want, but and what you have to look at and kind of put in here, like so, save it, and then I can see basically my my uh, dashboard here. So just a quick uh, FYI there. Uh, but what I would like you to do is go to uh, apps right here, because when we're we're talking about uh, endpoint manager here, um, you know, we're really talking about um, you know, teleworking from home, right? Um, we've talked about this before with MFA. Everybody's working from home. Uh, so when we're talking about, you know, people teleworking, what are they using at home? What are they using while they're in their car waiting for their kid to get out of school? They're using their phone, right? Um, so, you know, they still got to work. Uh, so they're working on the move, which is great. Uh, but when we're talking about securing data, right, on a living personal device, uh, we can't protect the device itself, but what we can do is actually protect the application. Uh, so when we're talking about uh, BYOD or, or bring your own device, um, you know, we want to be able to protect, you know, our, our information, right? Our company's information. So um, we are going to be talking about um, basically the Intune is basically the 100% uh, cloud-based mobile device management, and then mobile application management, which we're going to talk about now. So uh, if you go up to apps, right, uh, and you kind of scroll down to policies here, and you go to uh, app protection policies, go ahead and click app protection policy. And we're actually going to go up and actually create a quick policy. And it basically, we're just looking at, you know, iOS, Android, Windows 10, uh, or higher, right, or later, um, you know, so let's say if we were, uh, you know, if we had Apple, um, you know, iPhones or whatever, right, we can, uh, we can call it iOS um, App Pro, right, protection, uh, and then we can put a description in here uh, if we wanted to, um, and then go to next here, and basically what we're looking at is we're, we're targeting, uh, Target to apps, right? So it's already clicked yes for you. Uh, if it's clicked no, make sure you put yes, okay? Um, and then look where it says uh, target policies two, and there's a little drop down. So if you click the little uh, Chevron right here, you can see that we can um, select all apps, 
all Microsoft apps or all core Microsoft apps, right? So depending on what you're you know, trying to actually protect or applications you're trying to protect on personal devices, uh, we can apply those two here. So what if we didn't know which ones were in what, right? So like if we click core Microsoft apps here, um, if you click on view list, uh, this blue lettering right here, it basically pops up with a blade on the right side where it shows you all your core Microsoft applications. And you can go back and look at, you know, all Microsoft applications. You can go back and look at, you know, all applications. So it's all, it's even third party apps that, you know, aren't Microsoft as well that, you know, you can protect. Okay. So we're just going to do the core uh, Microsoft applications here. As you can see, there's Word, uh, Teams, SharePoint, uh, PowerPoint, Outlook, um, you know, basically all the, the regular stuff we use to a day to day basis, probably, right? So go ahead and click uh, close here. And then go ahead and hit next. And really with data uh, protection here, uh, we're going to click through a few of these, uh, probably say the more important ones here. Uh, but backing up data uh, to, in, to iTunes, right, or iCloud, um, do we want to let people basically save information to their personal cloud? I'm going to say no, right? We want to block that, right? We want to make sure that they don't save information they're not supposed to on their personal cloud. Um, send organization data to other applications. Okay, that's great, right? If we want to use one app and we want to send it to, you know, information to another app, uh, that's great. Uh, maybe we want to do it with other managed applications, right? Because if we send it to an application that we don't are or not protecting, right, don't know about, um, you know, somebody can get into that application and steal that information. Uh, and then right here where it says uh, save copies of data uh, or organization data here, um, do we want to let them save basically data to their desktop, their personal desktop, to their phone? Uh, I'm going to say no, we want to block that, right? But what we can do is point them in the right direction. So right under that, where it says allow users to save copies, uh, we want to, you know, show them, hey, but you can save it to your OneDrive. You can save it to SharePoint, right? That's where we want to save, uh, you know, documents anyway, right? Um, so, I mean, there's other things in here, if like URLs, um, you know, we can go through this entire thing. It would take, you know, quite a bit of time. But, um, you know, if you wanted to, you know, allow URLs to pop up, um, you know, when you go on your phone and you click on like a number on an application or, or a website and it says, you know, call here and then it pops up with the phone, phone number on the bottom and then you can call it immediately. Those type of little pop ups uh, you can either allow or not allow depending on what you want. But we want to make sure that, you know, when we're talking about encryption here, we want to make sure it's required, right? We want to make sure our data is uh, encrypted. Uh, so if you go further down and go to next here, we can go to access requirements. So when we're, when we're accessing uh, basically applications, right, uh, we want to give uh, certain types of uh, requirements. So when we're talking about requirements, we can t we can say, hey, we want you to log in with a PIN, right? We want you to log in with a password or hey, it has to be so many digits, right? Or so many characters. Um, but what is great about this is we can use biometrics, right? We can ensure that it's you because, you know, we, we're using, you know, uh, touch ID, right? Uh, right here, we're, we can do face ID, um, you know, instead of a pin. So, you know, using facial recognition, um, you know, which is hugely great because, I mean, they can tell twins apart, right? Uh, I don't know uh, who else could do that, but, uh, you know, basically computers, right? <laughs> but, uh, it, it's it's insane. Uh, even identical twins, it will know which one's which, um, which is cool. But these are the things that you can do to apply to your, you know, protecting applications to ensure that, you know, only that user is using it. So if you go down to the bottom and click next here, and then we have conditional launch. So with conditional launch, uh, basically, you know, uh, let's say it's pin attempts, right? Maybe maybe we have a pin thing going on here. Uh, they have to put in the pin to get in, 
Uh, maybe they lost their phone. Uh, their phone was stolen. Um, you know, they're on the beach on vacation. They left it on. Uh, somebody picked it up and they're trying to get into your work data. Um, you know, they put in their pen attempts five different times. We can reset the pen or we can even wipe the information off from, you know, the personal device even. Okay, so, you know, uh, grace periods, uh, you know, we can either block access, we can wipe data. So let's say, for instance, somebody's leaving the organization, right? Um, you know, they're great people. They're moving on to bigger and better things, but we don't want them to take our information with them, right? So at, you know, whatever certain time or maybe it's their last day, um, you know, we wipe all the data, you know, work data off their personal devices, you know, their phone, their, their laptop or whatever, right? Uh, ensuring that they don't take data with them. And all that stuff is done. It doesn't affect the personal device itself. Okay, just letting you know that. Uh, and then also to uh, jailbroken uh, devices, we definitely want to make sure that's blocked. Uh, we don't want anything jailbroken to be accessing anything that's ours, right? So if you go next here, we can go to add groups. Okay, so basically what I'm doing is I'm adding you know, whoever I want to this policy. So, um, you know, maybe it's everyone, right? Because everybody works from home. Uh, maybe that's only certain people that uh, work from home or work, you know, while on the move, right? Uh, you know, traveling or whatever. Um, you know, maybe it's the executives, the finance, HR, maybe it's the IT guys, right? So I'm just picking four here and I'm clicking select and you can see the ones that I picked, right? Now, I can pick everybody if everybody's, you know, doing this type of uh, uh, stuff, right? Where, you know, they're they're either on their phone, their personal device, work, working from home or, or even at work, right? Uh, but I can click next here. And it's the same thing. I'm just reviewing everything that I went through uh, and then I create here. I'm going to double and click on what, uh, on what you said here, Phil. Yeah. Okay in a little echo but um two things uh a what we did not show you today was mobile device management or mdm uh, mobile device management means you take the device uh, ipad windows device whatever and you enroll it right and there's a um, enrollment process that um you know sometimes people find cumbersome but that will allow you to actually control the device that's where you could like have policies disable camera, you know, change the background, disallow certain applications from going and so forth. You're really controlling and owning. It's oftentimes I would say for corporate devices um, or for organizations coming off something like a mobile iron, AirWatch, Mass360. Uh, we've done a fair amount of that. And uh, I think what people find that is sufficient is more what we just showed and what Phil uh, eloquently went through today, which was um, MAM or Microsoft Application Management. Okay, you are focused on the applications you are putting on the device, controlling the policies and the data around that uh, application. And when the user leaves, uh, that you are able to pull that application and the data back simply by saying, I'm deprovisioning that device. Now, again, that device was never quote unquote enrolled in your, uh, it just was had its applications enrolled. The group and the user was enrolled. Um, so you have the ability to do uh, three things with those managed applications, right? In managed mode here. Um, you can, if you put the application on, let's say OneDrive or uh, you know the office suite of products, Word, Excel, OneDrive, Teams, that means that uh, because you put it on and you're managing it, you could take it off. So that's what it means by a partial wipe. Uh, partial wipe is only available through the mode that Phil just showed you here. Secondly, you can control uh, policies around that data. So in addition to telling people they can only store in OneDrive, which was a policy you looked at, the data within OneDrive, um, you can, uh, that's the data that would come back uh, as part of the policy. Um, so it kind of tells people and guides people as to where they can store things. And then last, you do have a whole set of policies around, you know, data protection, access, and uh, other items for how those people can get to that data. So you still can disable the camera or, uh, as Phil showed, uh, iCloud access. So that data cannot go up to iCloud uh, to be backed up, right? You might have your own backup mechanism for it, or if it's part of OneDrive, you know, you're uh, focused on it being part of that uh, central storage. So.
in any case, Intune has been extremely popular recently um, and uh, wanted to kind of make sure you got that highlighted. Phil? No, I what's appreciate next? It. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I, I know we've got 12 minutes left here, so not a ton of time. Yeah. Uh, just showing them here real quick. <clears throat> Excuse me. Sorry. It's basically you can see what we just made. It says deployed. You can see it says no. It takes about 15 to 20 minutes for actually deploy, uh, you know, over your system, right? Um, but what I'd like to do is kind of show you, uh, you know, what happened here. Let me see. And basically what I'm doing is, like, let's say, for instance, um, you know, here's my phone, right? Um, you know, I'm waiting for an important email uh, on Outlook, right? Um, I'm waiting for this email, but, you know, I like to go to the gym at lunchtime, and it's 11 o'clock, and it is gym time, ready to go, right? So I go to the gym. Uh, but while at the gym, so kind of, you know, wondering if this person had emailed me uh, that was supposed to email me this morning. So I can go into my phone here. Uh, I can look uh, to my Outlook uh, app that I've uh, downloaded, right? And it's basically asking me for my biometrics, right? So it could be, you know, my fingerprint, which is I'm showing you here. It could be a facial recognition. It could be a PIN or password, depending on what you want. Uh, but using my biometrics, it knows it's me, right? And now I can get into my Outlook. And that's how I'm protecting, you know, my applications on personal devices like my phone here, right? So, which is which is cool, very cool. So, uh, let me pull this up here real quick. And I'm going to send out another poll here. Sorry, one second. Phil, I think after the poll, maybe I'll just jump into, uh, you know, yeah. and wrap things up and get sure out of here a couple minutes early here but it's been uh you know i think hopefully helpful for everyone to kind of get inside the console uh poke around a little bit with some facilitation and uh and see where things um see where things are at we're office 365 is a pretty big animal um bigger than office 365 uh microsoft came out with m365 right which really kind of wrapped enterprise mobility suite and windows licensing into Office 365. So uh, the licensing uh, guide that I provided in the IM window earlier is only meant to kind of show you what you own or maybe what you could own. Um, and uh, we try to use exercises like this to help you figure out what pieces need to get used. I just read a article, I think yesterday on like, you know, uh, they did some diagnostics across people's tenants, right? They're just uh, using telemetry and basically saying how many people had MFA turned on, right? And Unfortunately, it was like 38%, right? Unfortunately, it, you know, it, the numbers are lower than you might expect. How many people, you know, are taking advantage of some of the bells and whistles that they already purchased and own? So that's really kind of one of our interest areas is to make sure people are doing that. And then secondly, um, there's a lot, of, a lot of things that changed. So Microsoft came out with Office 365 and there were some, um, you know, defaults were mostly towards functionality first and towards um, towards security second, unfortunately. And so one of the things we're finding, and I'm just gonna split this up on screen. One of the things we're finding is uh, A, MFA is not deployed enough, and B, people aren't looking, uh, people don't know what to look at in Office 365 to say, am I doing, am I in a good spot or not? So uh, we have two things that I'd like to talk to you about today really quick. This is not high pressure. These are each one day exercises or for our security review. Um, it can either be a one day exercise or there is uh, if you're not trained or don't have the time cycles to be looking at your tenant on a daily basis. We can uh, do that on your behalf. There are certain things that um, a one-time review certainly wouldn't be enough, right? I mentioned you're probably going to have a compromised account each month uh, for an organization that's 200 seats or more. Indeed, that's what we're looking for as one of the things on a daily basis. So I'll cover these real quick. Um, happy to chat with you more. Again, a one-day exercise to implement MFA in your world, okay? That would mean lighting up all your admins and making sure they have MFA and they have a good experience. Also a 10 user pilot for your users to have the binary flipped on. That part's pretty easy, but also to make sure they have a good experience across all browsers. Uh, I guess it's, I guess we have five. Oh, and then uh, 10, 10 users. And then we 
look at kind of what your future of MFA is. Like, so as mentioned, there's a lot of uh, other MFA that needs to get rolled out for VPN, um, for uh, you know, backup, internal uh, RDP, as well as for um, privileged users. So our goal is to get you started on MFA and to uh, make sure that you're walking in with a good plan. So that's our MFA workshop. Uh, by calling it a workshop, oftentimes there can be, um, depending on your size, uh, Microsoft funding that could be available. The second thing I would chat with you about is, again, a security review of Office 365. We aptly call it security review for Office 365. And um, I'll follow up with some details on this uh, to each of you, um, but it's a one day exercise. Uh, we get a project manager. We look at about 40 different things, uh, including, um, oh, well, I guess I'll show you, I'll give you a demo of kind of some of the things we're looking at, but um, uh, there's a lot that we look at one, one time. And then on a daily basis or weekly basis, we look at about half of those numbers because they don't, the others don't change all that often. And we do this by looking, uh, taking, aggregating the logs that get generated in your Office 365 and looking for certain activities and so forth. You're welcome to train yourself on how to do it. It's just a time consuming process. Again, we do this uh, one time uh, for a one day fee. This is a tool that uh, for those that are aware, John Fedor on our uh, side uh, developed effectively, uh, when I say tool, it's essentially a aggregate review of your logs surfacing problems by area so uh, and then putting a red yellow green stamp to it and if i clicked on any one of these in a real world it would go to um, that area and show me what the problems were by default let's look right here in the middle of the screen by default all of your users in your environment have powershell enabled it's default it's still the default today so for the last five years all of your users are able to run PowerShell against your Exchange environment. Do you want them to? Probably not. Should you disable PowerShell? You probably should. Have you? Don't know. I'll tell you soon, uh, as soon as you run this. Um, you know, look around, uh, I don't know, bottom right-hand corner, foreign mailbox activity in the past 14 days. Who's logged into my mailboxes from outside of the USA or if you're homed in the Europe, outside of your homed territory? Who's logged in from Amazon or um, or from Azure into your mailboxes? So uh, oftentimes you'll look at that. It doesn't always mean a problem, um, but I would guarantee if you haven't looked at it ever that you have someone in your environment probably logged around, uh, logging in right now. And that's their entry point. Uh, they're typically using that to send mails on behalf of that person, or they're looking for someone more interesting in your environment to send mails on behalf of. Um, you know, these are some of the areas. These are the 20 areas that we look at on a daily, weekly basis. And then there's a more thorough area uh, that we look at other uh, tenant settings to verify that you're in a good spot. So I, without further ado, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. But these are um, areas you should be interested in in how things are set up and configured uh, as you know, oftentimes they were uh, a change in defaults from the previously. Phil, I think that's all I got. It's 1127. Uh, any wrapping comments uh, as we yeah, I'd just like to thank you uh, for letting me be here and uh, you know talking with everybody today. Uh, thanks for your help as well. And then also too, you guys have uh, you know access to this environment uh, throughout the day. So if you want to go in there and kind of click around and, you know, did what we did today or, or something that you're, uh, you know, interested in, uh, go ahead and click through there. You're not going to mess anything up whatsoever. So, uh, you know, if you do, um, you know, it's, it's all right. Thanks, Carlotta. I know you're one of the uh, implements that uh, you have that uh, in your environment. So uh, it, it is, uh, we think we're, I don't know, we're at four or 5,000 mailboxes we're evaluating on a daily basis at this point and uh, certainly seeing a lot of nefarious activity. Things are things are not getting any calmer out there in terms of the uh, the bad guys uh, and their attempts, attempts and approaches to our networks. So uh, thank you all for your time and attention. And, uh, you know, we'll be hosting this again next week if uh, or next month, rather, uh, if there's um, you know, someone else that you'd like to send from your organization to uh, kind of get a lay of the land as to what activities are there. So thank you much all. And we also have an Azure uh, CIE coming up on 
February 8th. Uh, so it would be a similar style. And uh, Phil, I think, will be coordinating that with Dylan again also on the back end. So. Yeah. Thank you all. Yes, sir.